This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, wait, wait. Okay, we're back. Yep. We're, we're live. We're here at the, the 3 o'clock block with Lou Pudirisi of Eprink. Uh, he joins us from Washington just after arriving back from Jakarta. Uh, welcome to the show yet again. We certainly enjoy okay. having you here. You're a globetrotter. If we can catch you at any <laughs> moment in time, we're happy. Yeah, thank you, Jay. <laughs> I'm glad that uh, Jeff Kissel was able to uh, substitute for me last uh, couple of weeks back. <laughs> well, it strikes me over the couple of years we've been doing this program that you're traveling more. And that's a kind of indicator, isn't it? Uh, you're traveling more, that you're involved in more conferences, yeah, more deals? Yeah I'm, traveling a, yeah, I'm traveling a lot more because of the global scope of the research program and the a growing interest and sponsorship from the government of Japan and the government of the United States. It's a great place to be. You know, you're on a wave right now, it seems like to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, and, let's... Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to talk about, you know, what seems to be big news on the environmental front, and that is uh, the resignation of Scott Pruitt, um, and, and how much effect that's going to have on American environmental policy. Um, so now we have Andrew yeah. Wheeler. He, he used to uh, work for EPA, and uh, his policies may, may be very much the same. Uh, what, what's your take on it? Uh, yes, I think actually um, the new deputy is very much has you know it, it's very much consistent with the general overview of the administration for widespread regulatory reform in the environmental side. I don't see, uh, you know, that there's a couple of, there's a three or four big issues out there. Uh, one, of course, as we've talked about in the past, is uh, CAFE, mm -hmm. uh, corporate average fuel economy. And mm -hmm. uh, I, if you, I, I can tell you a long story about what's going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, another issue is whether, and I don't see any, movement in this issue either, whether a price should be placed on carbon. I don't see any interest in the administration to do that, but that issue is still uh, percolating in the background as people, as different interest groups tend to look at the regulatory program and say, look, there's got to be a better way to do this. You know, we're sort of trying to, you know, trying to limit carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. And then uh, against that, uh, so there's that background. And then there is wide scale, you know, there's still a great deal of interest on the what to do about uh, the renewable fuel program, which is this mandated use of ethanol into transportation fuels, which is continuing to be a problem because it's man the volumes are mandated, but gasoline demand in the U.S. is not growing. It's mm -hmm. likely to remain flat for mm -hmm. the next 20 years. It's actually decline a bit. Mm -hmm. and then remain flat for the next couple of years. And, and so those issues are out there as well as many other ones, but those are sort of the, some of the big ones. Well, the, I mean, you know, it's almost as if, and we've heard this before in other circumstances, uh, when uh, the President Trump got into office, uh, his, his direction was take, all the, take, take the wings off EPA. Let's just dismantle the organization. And yeah, so it, it, sounds, it sounds to me like, um, you know, Pruitt has done a fair amount of work on that score. Uh, and aside from his personal picadillos and his overspending and, you know, be misbehavior around the office, um, he's, he's effectively advanced Trump's agenda uh, to become less environmental every day. Would you agree? Yeah, but I think, I think that you need to sort of temper that with the fact that, uh, first, we have a huge number of environmental regulations which are implemented at the state and the local level. Right. Right. So those are not changing. Those are driven by state government. Then we have uh, a series of big federal regulations which affect the uh, emission of criteria pollutants into the atmosphere, the uh, emission of effluents into the water supply, and of course efficiency standards, which uh, are promulgated by DOE, but also automobile standards. And in many cases, you know, we've talked about this before, in many cases, huge accomplishments have been made. And so one of the, you know, it's not just like Trump is this sort of, uh, you know, evil character who came out of the sky. He's reflecting kind of general sense from parts of the 
political, you know, parts of the constituency that, well, some of this environmental stuff is very costly and yielding very low return mm -hmm. in terms of environment. Now, I mean, this is not how it's uh, this is not how it's presented in the press, but this is the reality. And I'm, I'm not saying that I necessarily agree with what everything Pruitt did, but I'm just saying that beyond the kind of painting of bright colors of good guy, you know, black hats and white hats, there is a, a background of genuine debate on, you know, how should how should we you know, regulate the environment mm -hmm. efficiently? Yeah. But, well, I mean, I, I think mean, I think it's you know, clear that a lot of people in, in industry don't don't really like the EPA uh, and have felt you know, that the EPA has been like, overbearing over the past few years. Well, I think you know people look at uh, you know if you look at the uh, I can you know if you look at some of the things that go on. I, I mean, I do think there is. Unfortunately, our political process is not amenable to this, but I do think you could have a reasonable discussion which says, okay, how should we, what's the least cost method to reduce carbon emissions into the atmosphere, right? What's, what's, what's the cheapest way to do that? Because, and instead, we have this patchwork of regulatory programs. And some parts of the country are doing things that cost uh, fifteen hundred dollars a ton, and some folks are doing something at fifty dollars a ton. Right. 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 And so, and uh, you know, it's a global problem. I don't know if you saw the, you know, and and you do have participants on, let's say, the other side. For example, there was this uh, court suit in California, which the judge threw out, in which. Uh, uh, the cities of Oakland and Alameda and San Francisco sued like six oil companies saying they should pay. They should pay a lot of money for carbon emissions, right, for global uh, consequences of uh, global warming. Mm -hmm. And the judge said, well, actually, they produced it, but it was the it was the consumers that burned it. I mean, are you saying that all the accomplishments of fossil fuels that uh, improved the life of mankind, that somehow those should be ignored? So, I mean, it's, we need more intelligent ways to do it. And I think part of the problem, if, if you think of this as a left-right problem, part of the problem is on the left kind of seeking very unreasonable things, which cause the reaction on the right. Yes. So, uh, you know, I mean, clearly... I understand, I understand, the, you know, the desire to paint this as good guys and bad guys and, you know... <laughs> Trump is not my particular cup of tea, but I'm just saying this issue is more, you know, there are more nuance here than meets the eye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now uh, Pruitt gets, you know, thrown out effectively, resignation or otherwise, yeah, because yeah. because of his personal management style and his overspending and the like. Um, and, well, and, I think that I think there could be another reason also is that he he also right, was unsympathetic to the farm block that wanted mandated use of uh, biofuels into the, into the transportation fuel system. Mm -hmm. And I would, not, uh, I would not discount that, disfact, that dissatisfaction, which is a very large base of the Republican Party mm -hmm. and very worried about the upcoming election. Mm -hmm. he, he was not sympathetic to the use of mandated volumes of biofuel in the transportation system. Mm -hmm. And so the way he implemented the existing law on that, I think a lot of the farmers felt he was, uh, you know, not following the law. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have Andrew Wheeler. Um, yeah. And uh, the likelihood is he's, he's not going to be nearly as uh, infamous over his management yeah. style and, I, I and his say, spending. that's the case. He, you know, he has a well experienced. He worked on Capitol Hill. He worked in the administration, uh, in a previous administration, the Bush administration. He knows the ins and outs of EPA, so he is unlikely to be a lightning rod. He will be a lightning rod, but not the same way Pruitt was. He did represent coal interests when he was in the private sector. So my question to you is: aside from the, you know, the front office things that brought. Pruitt to, to yeah. the front page. Um, how is Wheeler's policies uh, differ? Is he going to be really they're doing not, the same I, thing? I, I don't think they're any different. I think it's going to be just less of a lightning rod. 
it's going to be more methodical. And uh, and some of these issues uh, do reflect actual powerful interests in society. I mean, what we do about CAFE and uh, how much should we pay for the you know implementation of subsidies for electric vehicles, it doesn't matter who's I mean, yeah, if, if, Ob- if the Obama administration was still in power, the auto industry and the, some of their allies would get le- much less interest on this whole cafe fight. That's true. But I don't think it's going – I don't think it would be entirely – you know, it just wouldn't be hunky-dory. Uh-huh. These, these, some of the fights you see at EPA represent genuine political and economic disagreements for which we don't really have a good answer yet. Uh-huh. Well, one thing is for sure, Lou, the press is going to be watching uh, Andrew Wheeler like a hawk um, to see uh, if there are things there that are reminiscent of some of the abuses by Pruitt and seeing you yeah. know, whether his policies do change one way or the other. Yeah, I think, I mean, I do think that, you know, what people are not, there is this, you know, one of the interesting things is there is this growth of renewable fuel in the electric power sector everywhere. And with that comes certain challenges to the grid. And it's quite interesting to see DOE actually trying to try to give special treatment of coal facilities and nuclear facilities. And this is getting very little traction. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're still being, we're overwhelmed a little bit by the fundamental economics of, uh, mm-hmm. of, uh, of what's happening in, you know, lower cost renewables. I mean, I do think renewables pose certain costs, but, uh, and that those costs are not reflected in the operation of the utility sector, you know, the backup power, the high cost of the grid, uh, you know, what do batteries really cost? The, all these things are going to start to... <laughs> Get, get circulated out, but you know. Okay, Lou, we're going to take a short break. We come okay. back. I, I'd like to talk about gas. I like to talk about your uh, your joint research in Jakarta. Um, I like to talk about LNG in the Pacific Rim, and I like to talk yeah. about the World Gas Conference, which Absolutely. took place in D.C. We'll be right back okay. after the short break with uh, Lou Pugliarisi okay. of Deep Break. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. on ThinkTech Hawaii of Pacific Partnerships in Education. Every other Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m., I hope you'll join us as we explore the value, the accomplishments, and the challenges of education here in the Pacific Islands. Today, we're about to be a lot easier. <laughs> we're back. We're <laughs> live with it. Lou Pudirisi. He's the CEO of EPRINC, an energy policy research think tank in Washington. And he's just back from Jakarta. So I guess a question, an abiding question here, Lou, is what were you doing in Jakarta? Okay, so uh, every year for the last six years, there's a meeting in Tokyo of all the world's uh, consumers and producers of liquefied natural gas, right? And if you go back a few years, there would just be Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. They, They were virtually the only consumers of LNG in the world, and there were just a few producers, Australia, Qatar, uh, some uh, some modest supply, very small supplies out of the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska. But uh, several forces are underway, including massive discoveries of natural gas, and the enormous interest in dealing with local air pollution, not necessarily you know, global warming, but local air pollution, particulates, the very, and you've seen these uh, uh, pictures of uh, uh, pollution, air pollution in uh, Beijing, Nanjing, 
uh, Delhi, you know, and a lot of the Asian countries have real problems with air pollution. So uh, Prime Minister Abe and Trump have been working on this joint project in which the Japanese, with their long experience in LNG, would help and promote the build-out of regasification facilities throughout the Pacific, and the U.S. would undertake uh, policies to promote and advance higher volumes of uh, liquefied natural gas exports from the U.S. And so this project brings together all the major uh, producers, particularly in the U.S., and a lot of the current and prospective new consumers in Asia, such as uh, Vietnam, Thailand, Bangladesh, India, China, and uh, Indonesia. And uh, our role in this is to uh, produce a report and a set of recommendations that for this year's event, which will be October 22nd in Nagoya, Japan. And we're doing that jointly with a Japanese research group called the Institute of Energy Economics in Japan. And this was our uh, first work, uh, workshop of the 2018 series. Mm -hmm. That's and, great. Uh, yeah. So, I, you know, I just uh, wonder, you know, it comes to mind, you, you know, this is, this is something we've talked about that you've mentioned on and off uh, about the United States with its huge gas supply, um, s selling gas, LNG, um, to, uh, to Asia uh, through, through Japan. Uh, but one of the buyers is China. And as I recall, it doesn't take much to recall this. We are in a trade war with China, yeah, so imposing tariffs on commodities. So is China right. going to scuttle this by imposing a tariff on LNG? So in the first and second round of tariffs, which we looked at very carefully, the Chinese did put widespread tariffs on a range of American uh, products, uh, petroleum products, including crude oil. Interestingly enough, they have so far uh, not, uh, not uh, imposed any tariffs on the importation of liquefied natural gas from the U.S. That has remained off the list. And that may be off the list for a couple of reasons. One is uh, they, want the LNG, they want access to the cheapest LNG in the world. They don't want to uh, make themselves vulnerable to pricing power from competitors to the U.S., but it also might be to leave an opening to find a pathway out of the trade war. Ah. You know, so I think those are the two things. That would be my assessment. It's quite clear the biggest issue with China in our – if you went back a year ago, the LNG market was in the tank in the sense that LNG prices in the Pacific were half of what they are today. But because China and India are so big, they, just, they began to enter the market, and they might have only bought another 5 or 10%, but they're such big players. They have, they have caused the price of LNG to double in the Asia-Pacific region. Can you help me with one thing? You say it's a, yeah. it's a way out. It's a way out of the trade, trade wars. How, how would um, leaving LNG off the tariff list in China, China's tariff list, uh, create a, a way out of the trade war. Can you, can you give me that scenario? Well, I, you know, in, in itself, it's not enough, but the, I, pretty soon that they could be, they could, you know, there could be some concessions the Chinese make, and uh, they, you know, they, they make it clear that, look, we've never, you know, LNG is here. Let's, we're going to start to increase our purchases of LNG, you know, long-term commitments. Mm -hmm. We're going to make some long-term commitments. We have a very big, the Chinese have a very big proposal to uh, develop the natural gas reserves in Alaska for LNG, very important to certain political interests in the U.S. And they could say, look, let's get some confidence building measures. There are certain things we're going to do, but there are certain things you need to do. And as a as an initial step, let, let's see how, where we can start expanding here. Mm -hmm. And they could hope that there was some reciprocity from the U.S. side. So mm -hmm. I, I do think that they're leaving that, that door open there as a kind of exit strategy or a pathway to try to build back the trade relationship. Let me go it's not one, enough. One, not enough, but some, yeah. yeah. What, one thought that comes to mind is, is that um, the, the, the uh, infrastructure, 
the actual supply line of LNG in this particular project, American LNG through Japan into Asia, through so many parts of Asia, hasn't actually been built yet. Um, and I mean, no, hen um, hence the need um, for your report. But, but I'm just, yes. I'm wondering um, if, if, if that plays into the China strategy on this. In other words, they're waiting to see the infrastructure built and then they would address the question of a tariff. Yes, that's possible, but they would be the ones that have to, I mean, this is a big problem because LNG investments are lumpy. They're hard to finance without a buyer, but as the market gets bigger, it's starting to look more like the oil market. And so uh, companies are willing to take the risk on their balance sheet, so mm -hmm. to speak, knowing that they can find a home for this LNG. I do, and the other issue that came up in Jakarta that was just fascinating were the advances in small scale LNG. And you know, the Hawaiians looked at this several years ago and rejected it. But I think just like any other technology, I think that might have been premature because the new technology and the new scale, you know, the ability to scale down at low cost appears to be emerging now in a lot of different ways. I saw some fascinating presentation on, you know, LNG uh, put on a barge with little kind of, uh, you know, uh, let's say containers that were of a certain size that could roll around and be delivered to different islands, you know, in the archipelagos of Asia. So, I, you know, it came to me the debate the Hawaiians had over this, where they said, well, it's just not going to work for us. On the other hand, in the, in the time between that debate occurred and now, there's been enormous advances in small-scale LNG. Hmm. So I so, wonder if what you're, what you're saying is that maybe Hawaii ought to, take a, to reconsider that decision. Maybe, LNG, maybe it's time for another, another look, look at it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, if you read the press reports, uh, it seems that the Hawaiian governor, I mean, the, the, the Hawaiian administration, Governor Eng, are saying that they can do 100% renewable and that they have this battery in Kauai and that it's going to be very cheap. Uh, but I don't know if anyone's electric bills show that yet mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. That would be a nice thing to know. <laughs> one, one thing that uh, comes out of this is something you mentioned uh, before we started the show, and that is that LNG is, a, is, is playing a, a relatively larger role and, and petroleum is playing a relatively smaller role going forward. But LNG can't help pro propel cars. Um, LNG is not... Well, of course, uh, if you look at... That's, that's kind of true, but if you look at uh, two great advances in the small-scale LNG that I saw, one was its use as a substitute for uh, diesel fuel, particularly in India, uh -huh. particularly fleets. And uh, a lot of uh, cars in, in India are being run by CNG, which can, or, and uh, variants of that also can be just as well done off of LNG. So, yes, it's true that uh, the penetration of LNG into the automobile fleet or trucking fleet is very limited in the U.S. There is more, a lot more interest in that in the, some of the Asian, you know, the China. China has a lot of uh, LNG trucks. I mean, uh, I think something like 70,000. Yeah. So. And well, interesting, too, that, you know, I suppose in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the model going forward, the LNG would generate electricity and the electricity would, would go to uh, fuel the electric car. And so this is also a function of the replacement of uh, fossil cars with electric cars. But let's, yeah. let's move on to so our I do last... I think that... Uh, yeah, the, the big motivation, of course, is uh, local air pollution in China and India, mm -hmm. the Asian countries. They need the, the, the political pressure, even in the communist country like China, is enormous. So let, let's talk about China and India, because they were part of the World Gas Conference every three years, um, which recently took place in, in, uh, in Washington, D.C., with 12,000 yeah. people came around to discuss yeah, so gas have, on a global basis. Can you talk about that conference? Yeah, so I thought it was absolutely fascinating. It took over the entire convention center, 12,000 delegates for a whole week. Um, you know, this is such a big deal that these big companies, they have exhibits. And I, I, I realize on these exhibits that, you know, they, they, have, uh, they serve people smoothies and drinks. 
those teams actually travel with the companies for these exhibits around the world. It's like a big, you know, it, I was just overwhelmed by the size of the whole event. And both the Chinese and Indian delegations were very big. No one had seen them so big before. And if you look at what's happening in the world, petroleum demand is, is going to grow, but its growth is going to be modest. But gas demand is going to grow enormously over the next 25 years. And so, that is what this is happening now. So now if you, if you look at China's role, you know, in, in face of the isolationist policies adopted by the Trump administration, where China, you know, fills, fills the vacuum left by uh, America's isolationist uh, policies. And then you look at China's active participation in renewable energy and now in, uh, in gas and LNG and so forth, and in this conference with India, it, it gives me the feeling that China wants to be, it has always wanted to be on top, but uh, it wants to be on top of energy. It wants to be on top of LNG. It wants to be on top of, of gas in general. That's why uh, it is active in a conference like the World Gas Conference. Um, and I guess this means that wherever it goes, whatever facilities it builds in other countries and continents, it's going to be, it's going to be investing in infrastructure consistent with its own. And if that is gas, then we'll see a proliferation of gas all the way west to Africa, no? Uh, yes, of course, that's true. And uh, this is also based on two, you know, two circumstances. First, China is has a huge kind of power requirement going forward, and we do not, right? Our, our power supply, we need more power over time as we replace the coal-fired power plants, but we have nothing compared to the requirements of these developing countries like China and India. And so, of course, they're going to look uh, very active in a lot of these areas. But even if you go forward, um, Almost all the forecasts I've seen on China and India, the best case forecast for China is that the installed coal capacity that's in place now does not grow so much. It doesn't go away. And there's a lot of coal installed. So I, I think that, yeah, there is a geopolitical concern. China's, uh, you know, one belt, one road policy. And investments in Africa and, and these places around the world. But there is, they also have a huge requirement. They're going to be buying a lot of gas from Russia by pipeline and, and but from Myanmar as well. So, Yeah, there was a piece about that yep. this morning's paper about uh, uh, Trump uh, complaining in, in the face of the, uh, what, NATO conference coming up, that uh, Western Europe was uh, buying too much gas from Russia. And uh, I suppose, uh, you know, that's another huge source of gas. And if you say that gas is the future, then that's an important deal, an important deal for Russia yes. and for Western yes. Europe. Right. And that is the so-called Nord Stream 2 project, which would be enough to take up an entire program. Okay. <laughs> I'm very familiar with that project. <laughs> we can... We will not be able to take your audience through that in a very short period of time. Okay, well, you, <laughs> what you're Let's suggesting to down. me is that, is that we, we are out of time, which is true. Yeah. We are out of time. And um, yeah. you're also suggesting it's something we should discuss in the future. So I hope next Absolutely. time we come back, we'll be able to address yeah. the Russian and Western Europe gas deal and compare that yeah. with the LNG deal that you're working on. So interesting. All right. It's, it's all global. Just just as you become exactly. more global, we become more global, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, Jay. <laughs> Lou Puderisi, so, the CEO of ePrink. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Jay. Talk to you in a couple of weeks. Okay. Take Aloha. Bye-bye. <laughs>